Um, so one could say many African countries are more concerned with development issues such as poverty, energy security, food, um, food security, etc. So the question is, why is it important for African countries to think about a post-carbon future? And, um, and what makes after carbon relevant? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, it's important that we plan ahead uh, because we are a set of economies, I'd say, that are very much dependent um, on land systems. Um, land systems have got implications for carbon emissions. Uh, so we can't just continue to grow or to produce uh, with those emissions um, because even if they're not a problem right now, they could become a problem for us tomorrow. And I think um, the, the general tendency to think that you can decouple development uh, with um, emissions um, is a naive one because these things are very much, um, you know, they're very much in, um, linked, they're intricately linked. So we, our mode of development right now, um, I guess one can say is, is still not a risky mode of development. It, it's not like what we've seen in the rest of the world, um, but it's one whereby we must start avoiding um, emitting um, emissions that would be harmful, um, harmful to our societies, harmful to our health systems, um, harmful to that very high dependency that I mentioned that we have already with um, some of what we would call our basic sectors like agriculture, um, which is um, also undergoing a lot of degradation already. Um, and given that our dependence on our land systems, if we don't really get ourselves ready, if we don't um, reverse the trend of these emissions, uh, we could be we could be in a in a really um, difficult situation um, later on. And I think the, the, the difficulty for us is that as we are preparing for that um, post-carbon economy, we have to prepare with everything we have. Um, we have to prepare um, for our economies to be aligned with a post-carbon economy. We have to make sure that development is at the centre, still at the centre of that ambition of uh, moving towards a carbon um, low carbon development um, and we have to prepare also I think technologically uh, because many of the other countries have already gotten those things as a given. Um, in Africa I think our, our space is a little bit more um, stressed because a lot of these preconditions are not quite in place. So we, 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 we're basically firing on several cylinders and, and that is what we must do, because the, the time is um, very limited. Um, the space of what we might do in terms of production and emissions is also compressed. Um, a lot of the space has been eaten into. Uh, the atmospheric, atmospheric space, I'd say, has been eat, eaten into. Our carbon budget is very low, uh, because three quarters of that has already been um, taken up. Um, by emissions from elsewhere. So, so preparation um, is essential. If we don't prepare, um, we are, I think, um, opening ourselves up um, for further problems that we may not be able to solve because others would have been looking elsewhere and we'll find ourselves very much um, in our own little corner uh, with limited resources or no resources at, at all um, for you know, what is to come. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so I guess um, to sort of follow on from that, are there, um, where do we stand right now, the continent, in terms of transitioning? Um, and there is, you would say, resistance, especially from those in, in carbon intensive industries uh, for example, the mining, um, the mining industry. Um, however, there are also many opportunities um, uh, that lie within that transition. Mm. So, can you talk to us about what those opportunities are and and how to balance the sort of the opportunity cost of the losses? Yeah. So, where we stand from 
from here or um, in terms of the wider, I'd say, ecosystem of um, emissions reduction, um, we could probably summarize that in three ways. First of all, I think it's important to say that transition is not uniform. Um, transition is happening, but it's happening at various speeds. And it's important to say that, you know, the departure point for transition is different uh, for different countries. So, so some countries are way ahead and some countries are kind of finding their feet. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing I would say is what I think is critical for Africa is to really identify the sectors where transitions would matter. I mean, and, and transitions in the plural. I mean, you've mentioned the mining sector. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, mining is not a big employer um, in terms of employment and, um, 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 how should I put it, um, productive employment. Um, mining doesn't employ a huge amount or huge numbers. Our statistics in mining um, is very low um, compared to other sectors of development. Um, so mining has got um, uh, problems um, in the sense that, um, you know, our, our, our soils um, will continue to be degraded if we continue to mine. Um, it will reduce the potential that we have in terms of food security. Uh, and that has also other worries or other problems because, you know, you can't, you can't separate food security from the water sector, you know, when we mine in some areas, what we're doing is also um, killing not just the soil, but water bodies and, and all of those things can be severely affected as a result of that mining. And we're mining increasingly intensively these days. There was some study not so long ago that mentioned that that intensive invasive mining is happening um, at a speed that is actually worrying and mining for less oil or less gas um, in ways that would not make sense um, for the kind of profits that we, we would want to see come out of this mining. So that's, I think, is something that we have to, we have to think about. And thirdly, I would say, um, we cannot simply just be dependent um, on these sort of resources forever because they're, they're finite. And even as we're finding new resources, um, new um, um, sort of reserves of oil and gas, um, we still have to think about the sustainability um, of these resources, but also the sustainability of our land system. Um, as societies um, would need other forms of development. And so the, the way in which we can think about moving away from this path dependency and diversifying into other sectors, I think is crucially important uh, if we want to grow our economies. So from that perspective, I'd say it is in our interest to really start thinking about ways in which we can do our development differently. And differently means we are acting in a responsible manner in terms of thinking ahead of what can be done in those very sensitive sectors um, that would produce emissions and that production of emissions can complicate life and complicate matters for us um, in terms of our development trajectory. So my, my thinking is that um, the reduction of emissions is not, shouldn't be a foreign concept for Africa because what others are doing and what we do ourselves would have um, implications for our economies. So we should also try, even if we have a low carbon footprint, to look at ways in which we reduce these emissions because they're very much connected to our survival mechanisms, our land systems, um, are what we are increasingly reliant on. So that, that, that is why I feel that um, we can't leave it to others. Um, if we leave it to others much longer, they will come in with their own modes of um, how the problem should be addressed. Um, we, would be, we would not be in the driver's seat. And, and we know that much of the resources that we need that would take Africa out of this problem um, are in Africa. If we're thinking about the necessity to expand our resources um, or to expand in terms of energy um, sources like um, tap into the renewable potential, 
a lot of the green minerals that would enable that expansion are, are in Africa. So I think different countries in other parts of the world would like to have the current problem that we have because we have a very low carbon footprint. But that will not stay the way it is um, if we also get into kind of um, reckless um, consumption and um, you know um, extractive um, ways of development because that will then have consequences for us. And I think that the worst case scenario is that others would have moved on and we might come back and not have the relevant tools um, to clean up after ourselves. Yeah, ex exactly, completely. Um, and um, I just wanted to ask how you see after carbon situating itself in this um, transition process? How can it help and, and what's unique about it? Well, first of all, I would say after carbon is about um, providing more momentum to climate action. There is a sense that climate action seems to have stalled uh, people have come out of Sharm El Sheikh with the sense that yes, we have a loss and damage um, facility um, and some some good results and have come out of the discussions and the negotiations at Sharm El Sheikh. But there is a sense that some of the other component parts of the negotiation are not moving as fast as we would like to see it. So giving it that momentum, that sort of drive, um, is important. And so after carbon is really about how do we ensure um, or, or act as a catalyst to enable countries in Africa to really um, be able to identify ways in which they can drive climate action. And, and a number of countries have been doing this, but it needs to go much faster um, countries in the global north need to go um, um, faster, but countries in Africa also need to be able to think ahead um, in terms of how they can speed up um, some of the other development transitions that they need to um, associate with uh, a post-carbon post -carbon future. So in essence, I think what is unique about it is the fact that one, it is a matchmaking service. Um, it brings, it changes the dimension of the conversation slightly by focusing more from a policy dimension and saying the policy challenges are with us. The policy challenges are related to how do we tap into all of these strategic minerals that we're talking about? What are the investment opportunities that will make it happen? Um, how do we take advantage of um, some of these new sources of energy like hydrogen that we're talking about? Uh, what's the direction of travel that would enable that to be um, fully implementable within the continent so that we're not just acting as a carrier for other continents to benefit from that, but we are also um, catering for ourselves um, and we're not sort of cordon off this um, um, production of energy where, whereby we are basically and others are consuming on the basis of what we're doing um, in terms of production but we ourselves are not taking full advantage of that so changing that narrative is basically starting from the policy dimension asking policymakers what are their major challenges how are they trying to resolve some of these challenges what in what ways does research offer um, solution, right? How can research come in? What, what, what are some of the technical solutions that could be put, put on the table? And how do we get these solutions to basically um, find ways of working, starting with the policy, traveling to the research um, or researchers, um, and going back to policy in ways in which that there, there would be a pull factor, in ways in which policymakers could then say, okay, what, what kinds of regulatory framework can we think about? How do we make this happen? Yeah. But we, 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 we simply are in that scenario where we think that waiting for research to resolve five, ten um, compelling policy issues might take too long. Um, and even though transition is about giving ourselves the time to do it properly, we also need to move um, full steam ahead. And moving full steam ahead means that we, we really ought to understand how do we make um, 
how do we, how do we bring solutions to policymakers? But how do we do it from their vantage point, um, so that we understand their need for speed, their need for scale, um, their need for coordination and coordination of the different efforts that they 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 they, they can see available to them. They need to think regionally, um, to think regionally about the opportunities that Africa has. This is not a situation where you just sit in your respective countries and think that, okay, you might be able to do this with this bilateral partner. This is a situation where you have to think laterally, but you also have to think um, in conjunction with other countries that have similar problems, working in similar ecosystems, and that have similar stake um, in this whole debate about carbon em emissions. And we also have to think beyond carbon. I mean, this situation was not a situation that, um, you know, was um, caused by Africa. Africa is paying for the externalities of the problem. So we have to think beyond carbon. Carbon is important, um, but we have to think about, you know, how we create new jobs for the youth, you know, how we make um, employment in some of these areas a lot more um, possible in terms of hydrogen production. Is that a possible area where we could think about new opportunities for the youth? Um, clean cooking, uh, is that an area where women entrepreneurs could be part of the supply chain? You know, how do we make these opportunities happen? How do we make transition happen? Um, we have some responses, but very often these responses um, are not seen um, within the wider platform. Uh, what is seen is Africa talking about investment, uh, talking about loss and damage, and whilst those problems are staple to the ongoing debate, we also have to say we are bringing solutions to the table. We're not just um, waiting for solutions to come from somewhere else. Um, and um, this solution starts with us because at the end of the day, this is about current and future generations. And Africa has um, quite a lot of stake um, in getting itself ready um, for this generation, but also for future generations as well. Thank you so much. Um for highlighting the need for for Africa to come up with solutions um, that are that are home owned, that are homegrown um, and owned. And um, when uh, you mentioned loss and damage and, and COP27, and um, often at these fora, uh, there are several themes or um, definitions that go around, which are defined from the northern perspective. One would say. And um, so I just wanted to get your take on um, the sort of outcomes of COP27, but more specifically the issue of, around the issue of loss and damage and what it means from Africa, for Africa and what are the next steps that we should be taking? Yeah, um, so I mean, COP27 was, I'd say, a success um, to a large extent uh, because one of the big issues related to loss and damage um, you know came with a very concrete resolution um, and, and um, decision um, on um, setting up a facility and um, because I think there's been an, a strong component of equity in this conversation for a long time that we are seeing losses and damages um, that are uh, way beyond what countries can adapt to. So the, the fact is that countries are not going to be able to um, continue, continue to adapt to these, these losses. Um, it, it gets to a point where it, it, it's almost impossible. So I think, I think that side, that recognition of um, the irreversible element of losses that, that are increasingly difficult to adapt to uh, has been recognized in previous COPs that seems to me has been um, that has gone further this year is the, the 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 litigation elements the fact that now there is at least um, some I'd say um, investment uh, and, and monies and pledges um, into a fund um, that could support those very countries um, that have been disadvantaged um, in this whole process, um, who are, have been saying for a long time that the recovering from, from these losses will not be a possibility. And so how then do we 
support them in terms of their livelihood and livelihood structures, um, infrastructure loss, um, economic loss, cultural loss. I mean, losses at so many um, different levels. So I think the, I think the, the fund is a, is a start. Um, I, I, I think we, we have to sometimes also look beyond just uh, because some of these things can be addressed and, and solved by monies, but um, you know, monies are not um, the, the necessary panacea to some of these big losses. Um, I think there are further investments that are needed um, in terms of supporting Africa um, to make big progress towards um, expanding on its um, renewable energy um, potential. Um, when we talk about production of hydrogen, we know that there are still problems around the refilling of, of hydrogen in terms of infrastructure, transporting it, um, the scale of how we could make it available. If indeed, um, as we say, there are countries that have got very strong potential in the production of hydrogen, how then do we make available to these countries some of the associated um, infrastructure that would help them um, consider this as a, um, you know, fuel, a fuel of the future and, and even a fuel of today, rather than just think in terms of the future. So, so I think beyond monies, beyond um, investment, there are other ways in which we can bring s support um, to countries with these, with these resources. Um, and, and some of that, I think, um, hopefully um, can be drawn from the loss and damage fund. Um, but, but important that we, we create a business, for instance. Um, how do we enable a business environment around the new resources that we're seeing? Uh, what kind of opportunities can we can we co create also for um, that would enable youth um, employment? You know, how do we help them um, have access um, to cleaner forms of of, of um, technology, and in what form? You know, so those those are all questions I think are, are for me are still very essential when we talk about the loss and damage um, um, issue. But I think. Nobody has all the answers, um, and you know we, we, we shouldn't um, sort of think that we've got all the answers because uh, we are increasingly making progress in one area and then seeing challenges um, that are emerging in other areas. Um, and I think what is important here is to basically um, work closely together with um, um, countries where the problems are more or less uh, um, shared. Um, but also work um, closely with um, development partners, with countries in the global north, to be able to um, understand, um, you know, how Africa could have access to new forms of technology. How can the production of hydrogen um, enable um, research infrastructure to grow in the continent? And so we're not always looking to the north um, for. Um, research technologies or a transfer, or transfer technology that's probably never coming. You know, how do we, uh, as part of these homegrown solutions, support African research institutes um, to begin to create that space um, that would enable technologies to grow, that would enable um, a research infrastructure to grow, that would enable engineers from this part of the world um, to come up with the solutions. Um, so um, these things have, um, financial implications, but I, I also feel that um, it's about um, um, another type of support um, that is needed um, that will um, bring the research together, bring the finances together, the investment together, create the markets, um, think ahead in terms of youth employment. You know, they're not just one solutions; they're several solutions and. The, the the challenge we have now is that we have to we have to act on all these solutions. There there are no, there's no sense of kind of doing one thing and waiting for something else to happen. You know we have to be as agile as nimble as we can and to be um, as I said before firing on all cylinders. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean I think that would be a that's a good place to end. Um, Unless there's anything, any last words you'd like to share with us? Well, um, just to say, the more we're able to um, appropriate 
um, some of these issues, the more we're able to think about loss and damage from our own vantage point, from our own te contextual experience, uh, the more I think we will we'll remain active um, change makers and the more we'll be able to think about our own innovative way of arriving at a transition. I mean, to, to a large extent, I think sometimes the word transition is um, a, a little bit, um, you know, overrated, <laughs> I think I can say, <laughs> because um, in many ways, the, the, this is a continent um, that, that, that really doesn't need the transition in quite the same manner that others do. Um, I think it needs to almost build everything from ground zero, um, whereas others have to transition because they've already done much, much of that building and now it's a matter of how they retrofit. Um, so they, there's no retrofitting exercise for Africa, So which is why it's important that uh, we're not um, consumed by definitions that are done elsewhere, by agendas that are designed elsewhere, um, and by issues that are not necessarily related to the hard realities that we see on the ground. So that will come with some degree of being, you know, we've been agile, but also being very attentive to what is happening in the global space. Um, that might push us into a direction of travel that we don't necessarily need to be. Um, we need to be able to say, okay, what's in this um, initiative that we can benefit from? Um, how are we going to use the benefits from that um, to design a trajectory that would support our development model um, in a sustainable way? Um, and how do we do it in a way that um, it doesn't come with a whole lot of preconditions um, and a whole lot of preconditions that um, may not necessarily um, change um, the, the manner of thinking, but may not necessarily also change our, our current development um, trajectory. So, so, so I think being attentive, um, thinking a little bit outside the box um, innovatively, uh, being in the driver's seat. Um, I, I often say that there's been several different types of revolution and um, this time around, I think, uh, if we were not part of the green revolution, if we're not part of the industrial revolution, we need to be part of the um, low carbon development revolution. If we could call it a transformation, this is where we need to be in the steering wheel, you know, or behind the steering wheel. This is where we need to say, this is about our future. You know, we have got the tools, we have got the resources. We've got those um, um, strategic minerals that, that, that will make um, a huge difference in the expansion of renewables. They're all here, we, they're resident in this continent. And, and therefore, rather than be told how to use them, let's begin to first of all examine, you know, the, the, um, the scope that we have um, let's examine whether we want to become a market, a consumer, uh, whether we want to basically just um, be involved in some kind of commercial activity where the benefits are transferred to others and we're still, you know, faced with um, energy poverty and it's still heavily stacked against us in terms of the implications of that. Um, let's think about all of those things. Let's think critically this time, and mainly because we, we, we cannot afford to let others think for us. We have to start um, um, pushing our own agenda forward. And I think that that's why this initiative coming back to that is so important. It's like we need to be one step ahead of the curve. You know, we can't just stagger into a transformation or a low carbon development with words that have been designed elsewhere that do not resonate with us, uh, with agendas that may not necessarily tie in with our development formula. You know, let's get back into the driver's seat this time and let's let's be the revolution. Let's let let's take control of that revolution, of that transformation, and let's drive it in, in ways that would benefit us and benefit our uh, you know, future generations. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Denton, for um, painting a picture of why After Carbon is so relevant and important for Africa and the need for us to take matters into our own hands to drive our agenda 
and um, have ownership in, in our low carbon future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.